Okay, I'm going to continue with the um, saturated buffer theme that Tyler started. We're both working at the same sites. And so we know that these saturated buffers are removing nitrate um, before it reaches the stream through those lateral tiles and the seepage um, to, to the stream. Um, so the big question is how, you know, how is that nitrate being removed? So Tyler is going into some of full denitrification studies to really see of what denitrification rates are, what, um, what could be t potentially be happening. One thing we don't want to be happening is um, for the denitrification to be incomplete. So just like Tyler said he can block the um, nitrous oxide from going to, into gas using acetylene, that can also hap happen naturally in these systems. And so as a result, you can get um, nitrous oxide emissions from the soil surface and also high amounts of dissolved nitrous oxide in the water moving through the buffer. So my portion of the project is, is going to look at how much nitrous is coming off of these buffers. So I first just kind of want to go into some of the consequences of excess nitrate. And, um, it's already been kind of touched on. Billy mentioned the hypoxic zone um, in, in the Gulf. And um, this is an algae bloom before, um, every, before that algae dies. And then the whole area becomes the, you know, the dead zone, as it's called. Um, but again, um, kind of like Billy, where I was like, what, what does this mean more locally? And he was talking in terms of phosphorus. Um, but in terms of nitrate, um, right here in Iowa, there has been uh, a, a pretty big controversy um, last fall. Uh, the Des Moines Water Works has the world's largest nitrate removal system um, to provide drinking water for the residents of Des Moines. And they are going to sue three um, conservation districts in northern Iowa. And so this, uh, th this is, it's, gonna, it's a really interesting time because uh, if this lawsuit go kind of goes one way or another, it could really set a precedent for the nation on um, what, what we want to do about water quality and nitrate leaving, uh, leaving farms. So um, I, I honestly think both sides have, have good points. Um, and so I think it's going to be really interesting to see, see what happens. But if there does need to be a large implementation of, oh, um, if farmers are going to have to implement ways to reduce nitrate entering streams, I think we kind of need to be prepared for that, and we should probably be doing it already. So um, I was recently at a, a drainage conference, um, an agricultural drainage conference earlier this year, and it seems when you go to some of these conferences, it's kind of, everybody has like one silver bullet that's going to fix it all. Like we could do crep wetlands. They're going to, you know, we could remove all the nitrate we want by slowing the water down into wetlands. Or bioreactors, where we take large amounts of wood chips and route the water through there to in induce denitrification. Um, or we could you know, use one of these uh, new saturated buffers to do this. Uh, cover crops have been suggested. There are a lot of ways. And I really think the way to kind of think about this, and I think it kind of ties somewhat to agroforestry, is we, we all kind of, I, there's, we're going to have to implement all of these um, to, to get, you know, reduction in nitrate across streams. And all of these um, projects are, are suited for different landscape types. And so I think we need to really keep an open mind and, and realize that every, pro every project is going to kind of have its limitations, but they're also going to have, have benefits in certain situations. Um, so all of these, um, these practices they're going for this whole denitrification. Um, they, you know, hopefully, ideally, the nitrate is going to nitrogen gas. And like Tyler said, you know, it's part of our atmosphere. No harm done. If it is being, if it's, it's, if it's being stopped at N2O and the denitrification is complete, we could, we could have a problem. We could, in, we could be trading a water quality problem for an air quality problem. And that, that's not going to fly um, with climate change and um, potential you know, global warming events. So, so today, um, I'm going to go through just a few of my objectives. I'll go through how we're measuring greenhouse gases out at the buffers. Um, I'll show you a little more detailed site design. Um, and then I'll show some of my 
results from the nitrous oxide leaving, leaving the buffers, and then, and then we'll kind of go into some future work. So the specific objectives of this project is to quantify uh, the greenhouse gas emissions leaving these buffers. And we also want to measure concentrations of dissolved gases um, in the wells that we have distributed across the buffers. And um, we not only want to compare the two saturated buffers that we have, but also different vegetation types and um, whether you know, a saturated buffer is emitting different greenhouse gases than an unsaturated. So the way we measure greenhouse gas emissions from the soil surface is using a, a vented chamber. And essentially, these are just a PVC ring that has been placed in the ground so the soil surface is exposed. And then we put one of these chamber tops on and we take a gas sample um, over time to get a flux coming off of a known area. So we can, we can scatter these throughout the buffer and then scale up to actually get cumulative emissions from, from each buffer. Um, tomorrow, we will, uh, during the field day, we'll actually have some of this equipment out there and we'll be able to show you um, how, we, how we measure this. Dissolved gases are collected throughout the year, unfortunately, because it's a little cold to be pumping wells when there's snow on the ground. But um, we essentially pump water from the wells and we put them into sample vials where we then take them back into the lab and we're able to, um, to measure the amount of gases that are dissolved in these samples. All of our gas me are measured on a, a gas chromatograph and we sample the dissolved wells monthly and we try and hit as many rain events as we can. Um, we also do the same thing for the terrestrial gas samples, um, but uh, we, we try and get those bi-weekly and really try and hit every rain event. So, so th this is the same picture that Tyler had up on his presentation. So we're, the, the design for measuring gases, we're going to try and hit all of these different vegetation types. So this is our Bear Creek saturated buffer. And the way we have this laid out, um, are we have wells that are in black here and greenhouse gas rings that are in white um, and we have transects going going along the buffer so um, we're hopefully getting multiple different vegetation types and um, and moving along the buffer as well to as towards the stream so we have uh, I guess the switchgrass we'll call it um, <laughs> growing here and so we have a couple rings there. We have what I like, I think is more of a transition zone where you're moving from those grasses into the forested area and then, and then the forested area. We are also going past that lateral pipe on the end there and we are measuring these same gases on uh, the unsaturated portion of the buffer um, for as a comparison. Oh, and this was the other, these are must get out of order. We're also uh, measuring we just started measuring um, gases also coming off the field because we don't want to say, oh, the saturated gases are worse than the unsaturated, but I think we really need to keep this relative and it, the buffer is hopefully going to be, you know, you know not, not, there won't be as much emission from the buffer compared to the field. So we need to also, you know, keep that in mind. Um, for the site on the tributary of the South Skunk, it is all in switchgrass. Um, however, for our terrestrial layout, our, our gas sampling, we kind of split, split up the, the rings according to proximity to that lateral tile. So we have ones that are near the tile and ones that are farther away. And we again have an unsaturated site and we will also be um, having some field, field samples there too. Um, the wells, it's similar, but we, I've divided them into transects a little further. So transect one is on the, actually the other side of the pipe. So water is really going to want to move, you know, this way, but there very well could be seepage this way from, uh, from the tile. This, the, the relief here isn't, um, it isn't that great of a magnitude. So that, um, we're, we're trying to also measure kind of what could be moving, moving back towards this way. So I'm going to just kind of jump into some of the data. These are the nitrous oxide fluxes. Um, so every sample point we have on here from the buffer. 
And if we look up top, it is the Bear Creek site. Um, the red is switchgrass, the orange is the transition, the green is forested, and then the black's unsaturated. Um, so these, these peaks and nitrous fluxes, um, we know when prime uh, denitrification is happening and where we could possibly get high nitrous oxide fluxes. It's usually after we get some rain and so there's, we'll have, if the, the tile is flowing and then we also have rain on top of the surface coming in so the buffer is completely saturated and then it warms up. Those warm wet conditions are really prime for denitrification. So we try and really, we kept, try and catch a lot of those. Um, so, but a lot of times you may think it's going to be a great day to go catch some nitrous and, and you don't really see much out of it. So um, we had, we had a, a hot moment here, is what I like to call them. Uh, and that was probably a rain event. Um, one thing I should have mentioned at the beginning here, the blue bars are when the, the buffer was actually flowing. That was really important. So um, because tiles do not flow all year, um, they, they normally flow in, in the springtime and stop um, in, in maybe late July, somewhere in that time range. Uh, but last year, we had pretty wet fall. And so we had, we had these points where the buffers started, started flowing again. Um, in the fall or even before we had a really hard freeze. They went pretty late this year. It was kind of an atypical year. Uh, but we are um, flowing now. And um, as we can see, I don't know if we can make any real conclusions on uh, if one vegetation type is, uh, is producing more nitrous than another. Um, the forested site here on this day had a really high one, but since then it's kind of stayed pretty baseline. Um, the one thing that has been fairly consistent is the unsaturated site. We really haven't seen kind of much peak at all. But we're going to need a lot more data before we can really kind of make any conclusions on, on that. So um, we also saw similar for the moss farm site. Um, again, that, that site doesn't drain as large of an area and it, it honestly last year didn't receive as much water. Uh, the Bear Creek site got a couple you know, big pop-up thunderstorms that hit Bear Creek but didn't necessarily hit, uh, sorry, the, the, south, the tributary to the South Skunk. So, so if, we, if we take these emissions and make them cumulative, so over time um, and we just do linear interpolation between dates. So we have, we take a measurement in March and then April. And then the best we can do is kind of linear, linearly interpolate between that. So the more samples you have, the better your estimates are going to be. But that's kind of the best we do, we, we can do. Um, but if, if, we, if we look at greenhouse gas emissions through time, uh, we started last August. Um, and we also compare, say, nitrous to CO2. Um, we can see that a lot more CO2 is coming off the buffer in comparison to nitrous. And these are all in CO2 equivalents. So um, nitrous oxide and, and carbon dioxide have different, um, essentially, they, they are different uh, powers of kind of greenhouse gases. So nitrous is much more powerful. So you kind of have to, you have to account for that. And if you put them on both um, carbon dioxide equivalents, um, you, can, you can directly compare them. So what we've seen so far is um, CO2 has made up roughly 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions that are coming off of the buffer. And, um, and, and nitrous has been very low. And so that's, that's good. Uh, this is also typical. This is um, typical for other studies that have looked into um, perennial you know, plant growth. Um, whereas if you were to look at maybe a, a, field, a field study, this nitrous could be, could be a lot higher because you're having fertilizer inputs and so you're getting these really hot moments of, of nitrous coming off. So in our dissolved samples, um, because we were just collecting, collecting a sample, we can only get a concentration. So we, we eventually could you know, try and quantify how much water was moving through the buffer at that time. But this is, this is kind of the, the best what we have is uh, a concentration of how much dissolved nitrous is in there. And what we've, what we've been finding is that it, it, it has been very high at, oh, no, I didn't want to hit stop. OK, there we go. That was a black screen. Sorry, wrong button. Um, 
it has been very high at um, in, in the Bear Creek site at those wells closest to the lateral tile, and then it's kind of fallen off as you get uh, towards the the forested section. So it it that essentially what what that's initially kind of saying is that 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 nitrous oxide is being reduced farther to N2 gas, um, and it is not necessarily being admitted through through the top. It's not being released from the water and then emitted through the, the soil surface. So, and that, and that kind of goes with what our greenhouse gas emissions were showing. Because we're not seeing these huge spikes of nitrous um, coming off of the soil surface, it must be being reduced um, while it's still in the soil column. So, um, the other interesting thing, at, since the tiles have started flowing this, this spring, um, we've seen kind of a drop in, uh, in uh, nitrous concentrations. And this could be that the, the residence time of the water, um, because there's so much water being pumped into these right now, it is not having the same amount of time to, to completely denitrify. Um, but that's, that's kind of just an early hypothesis, and we'll have to see what um, future data um, shows. So we also see the, the same thing in, in, our, in our South Skunk site. Um, and we, we see as we move towards the stream, just kind of these, the nitrous just drops off. Um, and this was also, this is also um, pretty much the same as we see in nitrate in the wells. So the nitrate in the wells closest to the, um, closest to the lateral tile are fairly high. They match what's coming out of the box. But then by the time you get to the stream side, there's virtually no nitrate. So they're doing a great job at removing and um, completely denitrifying, it seems. And again, if we looked at the um, unsaturated sites uh, along here, they are they're, they're pretty, pretty low as well. And they were low at, at Bear Creek. So I think the big kind of takeaways from this are nitrous oxide emissions um, seem to be slightly greater um, under saturated conditions on repairing buffers compared to unsaturated. Uh, but that, that's kind of an early, that's just kind of looking at the fluxes. And the majority of the time, the unsaturated for the terrestrial nitrous just kind of sits at the baseline. Um, but it'll be good to get those infield comparisons to kind of keep, keep that in check. Because that wouldn't be a great thing, saying that you, you know, if you don't saturate these buffers, you're not going to get as much um, nitrous oxide emissions. But if it's still reducing the amount of emissions coming off of the field, we would know we're doing all right. Um, so nitrous is also only making about 20% of the total greenhouse gas emissions, which is comparable to other um, perennial studies. And um, we have dissolved concentrations that are you know, reducing as they move towards the stream um, uh, in terms of, of nitrous oxide. So I believe, so some future work we're, we're doing, are we going to, um, com, com, we really want to compare to the field. We're also doing the denitrification studies. And we recently um, uh, put some pins in the stream bank to compare saturated versus unsaturated uh, bank erosion. So a lot like what Billy's doing down at Neil Smith, we're also going to implement to see if by resaturating these buffers are we possibly um, increasing more erosion. Um, yeah, and with that, I can take any questions. Uh, about the buffer, what do you mean by saturated and unsaturated buffer? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So a saturated question, please. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the question is, what is the difference between a saturated and unsaturated buffer? So an unsaturated buffer, we have the tile drains that Tyler spoke of, or Tyler, the tile drains that Tyler spoke of, um, going straight from the field um, into the stream or ditch. Um, with the saturated buffer, we have this control box installed where the water is moving and it is stopped and rerouted laterally alongside the buffer, and then. So ideally, the majority of the water is being pushed this way and that way, and there's not as much over, like, bypass flow. Does that make, does that make sense? So are you passing all those water through a drainage pipe or something? You yeah. Have to, along it to flow through the buffer? 
Yeah, so there is, the drainage pipe just goes straight out and then it's perforated so it has a bunch of holes in it and so um, it, the water is able to move to the stream through um, the buffer rather than being mainlined straight to the stream. Yeah, sorry, well, so, yeah, so that, that is a big, um, I guess, misconception with tile drainage. If you put a buffer in, uh, they're, 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 all of them are, the tile drains around here are still just mainline straight to the stream. So any buffer that you see is installed, it's still, nitrate is being directly exported. Um, there are still some, there's been some studies that still show some benefits of overland uh, flow that you get nitrate reduction, um, but it's still, the bulk of the nitrate is still just being mainlined straight to the stream. Yeah. How does the cost of implementing this compared to like a, a bioreactor or something like that per unit of, do you have a sense of like? Yeah, that, uh, that's, a, that's a good question um, and probably something that I should. What is the question? Oh, yeah, sorry. The question is, uh, do, is what, are, what are the cost differences between, um, say, putting in a bioreactor, a wetland, or a saturated buffer? Um, I, I don't have direct numbers, uh, but I do know that it's, it, it's not, I don't believe it's expensive to putting in a crept wetland by any means, if I'm correct. It's, uh, it's, it's cheaper than, on a, if you put it on a massive nitrate removed, uh, it's cheaper than bioreactors, um, cover yeah. crops, or nutrient removal wetlands. It's cheaper than any of them. This is. This is. Yeah, so on a yeah, massive nitrate removed. Yeah, that's Total expense in one of these is maybe maybe $1,000 in the box, um, and then, um, you know, three four $400 in the tile installed um, in each direction. So uh, we, you can put them in for even the largest wow. ones are well less than five thousand dollars. We haven't spent five thousand dollars on one yet. And does does the distance that you spread it, that you move it, depend on tile size, the diameter of the tile? Uh, how, how, how is that? Yeah, so it would it would it would depend on a lot of things. It would depend on um, what yeah, what you have in com your di the diameter of the tile that's coming out of the field. And it would also depend on how much buffer you have and um, whether or not the land is kind of how, how the land around that's also looking because you you need you need a good amount of fall from the field, um, but you don't want you don't want too much you know fall also. And then if you have any kind of hills going up this way or that way, the water is not going to have enough you know pressure potential to to make it out to the to the ends. So. Thank you. so what's the percentage of water actually going through the buffer? The percentage of water actually going through the buffer. So Tyler had that in some of his slides. It, so it, it, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, in, in the dry years, it was a little over 50%, 56%, 57%. And then in the wetter years, like 30 some percent. So, so that's a good point. Not, uh, you know, only 50 to, or say 30 to 50% of the water is actually being pushed into um, the buffer. However, it's removing almost all of the nitrate um, that, that is pushed in there. So, um, unlike, say, a bioreactor or Crip wetland. They, they're all kind of, uh, that, it, that is kind of one downside. When you get those big flows in the spring, when you have a lot of nitrate, a lot of the water, it, it's going to go around because your, whatever you know, system you have here, it just can't treat it, so. Yes? Um, when you put the different grants, maybe you have a, the slide um, showing which is absorbing more nitrate, right? Nit nitrate or nitrous oxide. Is that the fruit grass is absorbing the less? Um, I think you showed the emission was highest for fruit grass. Is that right? The, In one of your slides. Oh, the, the, dissolved, ni the dissolved nitrous concentrations? Repeat the question, please. Yeah. Um, absorbing the most of the nitrous, uh, nitrous oxide. This? Okay. So, so, 
This, this, is, this is dissolved nitrous concentrations. So, um, so this is the amount of nitrous oxide that, that is in each, each well sample, so the concentration of that. So the concentration is highest um, in the switchgrass, which is closest to that lateral tile. So you have the highest nitrate concentrations and the highest nitrous oxide. But as, as the water moves from the switchgrass to the transition of the forested, we are seeing a reduction in the nitrous oxide that is in the water, dissolved in the water. So that, what, what we're thinking as of right now is, is that nitrous oxide is being completely reduced by the microbes to into gas. So what happened in the switchgrass there? Well, it, I, think it, I think it's more of a proximity. So because the switchgrass, if the forest was closest to the tile, we would expect to see the highest nitrous oxide concentration in the forest. But because it's furthest away and the water has had time to seep through the soil, there's more time for the nitrate to be completely reduced. It's a matter of distance? Yeah, pro I think proximity would be the best, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, yeah. So I, they, I, I think that these two sites haven't been in long enough for, for us to completely assess that. Um, however, and that's kind of why um, some of those silver maples that are creeping up on the Bear Creek buffer, um, we're going to keep those back. And I, I think it would be a good thing too. I, I know um, that farmers have had experience with that where if you get silver maple next to a tile, the roots are just going to go right in. So I, I think it, it would be uh, a real problem. It would be interesting to see how, how long one of these would last before something like that were to happen. But I think you'd really have to, I think you'd really want to plant it in kind of, or have at least a grassy area to almost, uh, yeah, uh, it's a buffer from your trees almost, so. Mike, on these, what we did on the first side of Fair Creek, on the one side from the lateral out, we wrapped it fabric to try to keep the roots out and the other we didn't wrap it just to compare that question um, we have inlets or, or openings so we can get in there and take a look in year two we ran a GoPro camera down there so one small root on one side um, so we had we're concerned about that same issue we haven't seen it to be an issue yet we think maybe because these are going to be pressurized a long time with water um, that a lot of time with the water we might have less issue than And then some, you know, some of our prairie grasses have really deep root systems. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they can also have Yeah, we did. Yeah. We used to say that we didn't have to worry about warm season grasses with tiles going through a buffer that was a very buffer warm season grasses until we saw one plug with switch grass roots yeah. rock solid. So, yeah, they will. Yeah. These are still looking pretty good, though, because we were stuck our heads down in the outlets just even from <laughs> just keeping an eye on stuff. And so there's not many. So, yeah. yeah Mr. Part, what was the depth of the lateral you to? So it is about two and a half feet, I believe, at both sites. So, um, yeah, and that's, that's in hopes of kind of the water being able to kind of seep down and, and through there. OK. Okay.